When things refuse to work at this level, there's no manual, no one to call, because no one's ever done this before. So we figured it out the hard way, with interesting discoveries and answers. Double the power, double the madness. This is Peregrine 3. Follow along to find out what it took to push the fastest quad on Earth to its absolute limit. And finally, the sweet taste of success. That the fastest drone quad up the flight ever. Over the past two years, my son Luke and I have been building the world's fastest drones. Along the way, we set the record twice, only to see it broken, first in the US, and then in Switzerland. So we were itching to go faster. This time was a lot harder. This is a technical deep dive. I'll expand on the body design and the aerodynamics and find out the unusual reason for this tumble so you don't also crash this way. There are chapter markers for those who prefer to skip. We started out with bench tests, chasing the setup that gave us the best RPM, power and voltage stability. That's how we dialed in the right battery, ESC and motor combo, and even tested capacitors and TVS diodes to tame voltage spikes. We also learned the hard way, running throttle control through beta flight is asking for trouble. Without proper smoothing, high power setups can catch fire. At the heart of the build was the battery, an absolute beast capable of delivering a staggering 16 kilowatts and essential for our new speed. Power was doubled from last year and routed through the power distribution board to the four ESCs driving the motors. For the props, APC custom built blades with extreme pitch. That extra travel per revolution let us keep RPMs down so the tips didn't go supersonic. But it also meant the performance on takeoff was dreadful. It was like trying to launch a car in seventh gear. Getting airborne demanded five and a half kilowatts at half throttle, already pulling more current than Peregrine One ever hit at full speed. These props really like to go fast. An efficient cruise is 200 Ks or 125 miles per hour at 1500 watts. Here's how the design evolved through four redesigns. I will show you how each new model inspired fresh ideas and some new innovations. We built a quick test version on the Peregrine 2 carbon fiber frame and started our test flying to jumpstart the path to the final design. Right away the GPS was a headache, poor satellite count and no lock on takeoff. The fix turned out to be elegantly simple, mounting the GPS on the camera since both need the same orientation. We located the ESCs down the sides of our new longer battery so the nose wasn't ridiculously long and unwieldy. Even so, the setup was unbalanced. The root of the problem was the carbon fiber frame itself. By forcing all components forward, it ensured this persistent imbalance. Everything felt compromised. It was clear we needed a better frame solution. So to 3D print the main frame, if you rely on the skin alone, you can see there's there's massive flex. So the trick is to brace it and by doing that you very quickly you get a very solid arrangement. Gives you major stiffness where the flex is really only in the in the arm with a nice thin section there for minimum drag and of course you have to think about the cable duct for the cables. That makes it easy to swap out motors in the field. We came up with a really cool solution for the lock based on three radiuses that interlock. And then there's a rubberized TPU lock that locks it in place. And we started off with an oval pattern, but then transitioned to a, to a circular arrangement later because we needed more space. Oval that wasn't worth the complexity. We tested many different shapes and sizes and thicknesses to settle on the, our ideal shape. Carbon fiber, surprisingly bendy in, in twist, in torsion. And we discovered that through our torsion tests that the print matches the carbon fiber or even beats it in twisting strength. We experimented with sweep back that that's very prone to layer failure. Polymaker sent us their Fiberon material, which is carbon fiber infused nylon, as a test case to see if this is a world record material. The bamboo slicer needed some workarounds to get the voids in the right place, because just like bones that are hollow on the inside and their strength comes from the outer wall. We wanted to print material only where it adds strength. 
Another fantastic print from the bamboo. The finish is excellent and we found it very easy to print provided you take maximum care in keeping the nylon completely dry. And for this we found the dry box is absolutely essential. Okay, it's time for some abuse. Wow. Oh. Wow, oh, okay. That's beyond what it can expect from air forces. What is useful is during testing and crashing, you get a real life insight into where you haven't got enough stiffness or enough material and you can then beef it up. Our new nylon body allowed the battery to sit inside the legs, which finally let us position everything pretty much where it ideally needs to be. It was time to flight test the nylon frame to find out if it could actually handle the forces at these speeds. We were getting very good speeds and the frame was looking really solid and a great solution. But ESC temperatures spiked to dangerous levels very fast. In spite of the crash, we were happy that we matched the record. 557. What? But the air cooling meant the system overheated in the air and crashed. I think we need water cooling. Yeah. So we looked at water cooling like the previous record holder. Tank can be very small because water is brilliant at absorbing heat. The equivalent volume of air required is ridiculous. Plus we scored a very welcome drag reduction from no air ventilation. Luke developed the entire power system including the water tank that even has a pump so be sure to check out his video. The water cooling tank made the body fatter but the drag increase was marginal because the overall shape was now parabolic and more aerodynamic than the previous one with the cylindrical midsection. A circular cross section suited the water tank and eliminated the added complexity of the oval shape. Luke tried many tweaks to the tune, but the flights were persistently wobbly. The ideal is to achieve passive stability. In other words, where the drone heads straight, not from differential thrust, purely from a weather vane effect. To calculate this through simulations is really tricky. It's much simpler just to print a half-size model and experiment. And what is crazy is by moving the pivot point just a small amount, we go from an unstable situation where it just flies sideways to the, to the ideal position where it flies straight on its own, putting all the thrust into speed and not wasting any of it in trying to go straight. We now had our final shape with motors and arms moved back 25 millimeters, one inch, to ensure directional stability. This shape was contoured with CFD computational fluid dynamics for lowest drag possible. Here we have version 2 and version 3. Version 2 was done without any aerodynamic input and for version 3 we ran loads of virtual wind tunnel simulation. The result is even with a bigger battery and with bigger motors and a, a larger frontal area we were still able to get version 3, the equivalent of 15% lower drag, and that translates to about 40 kilometers an hour of speed benefit. The biggest lesson from all that our aerodynamic simulations is how your assumptions on what is obviously aerodynamically better can turn out to be wrong. You run a clever idea in the sim, and the wind tunnel just laughs at the idea. In the end, you realize that airflow is logical, but often in a completely back-to-front way. A great example is golf ball dimple. The dimples add drag to reduce drag. Let me explain. Drag is basically two components. It's skin friction and it's the shape drag. A wing experiences low shape drag and higher skin friction. A golf ball has an awful aerodynamic shape and so suffers mainly from shape drag because the tail doesn't tape it down nicely in the ideal teardrop fashion. It pulls along a huge messy wake of turbulent air behind it. Dimples increase the skin friction to improve the shape drag. The extra friction from the dimples is insignificant, but the dimples encourage a nice smooth airflow around the back of the ball so that the wake is much reduced and the shape drag reduces by a lot. The ball goes further and it goes straighter because there's less turbulent wake to shake it around. Dimples up the friction to reduce the shape drag by a lot. Back to front, but very logical. 
My advice is to assume nothing about aerodynamics. Do your wind tunnel homework so you can be certain. Otherwise you risk throwing away speed for nothing. Lift is basically a free bonus of high speed. Amazingly, you get enough body lift from just a one degree nose up attitude. You pay the price for extra weight in poor acceleration and in hover. And so most of our aerodynamic effort went into drag reduction. Thanks to Airshaper, we were able to eliminate guesswork to arrive at the most optimized design based on fact. The Airshaper interface is simple to use. You drag in your 3D model and there is a nice animation for checking your model and doing the setup. The nose up angle and the RPM needs to be set. Pressure clouds are really useful in highlighting areas that need your attention. Surface friction is very good at pointing out flow detachment, which is the dark blue we see here on the trailing edge and on the tail cone. The model calculates forces for different elements and you can click on individual elements to register their drag and their lift component quite clear how disrupted the flow is behind in the prop wash and it reflects as the heavy blue area of flow detachment on the tail cone. Airshaper guides you through the shaping process through a feature called design advice where through colors it shows you where to move the surface inwards or outwards. You can obtain propeller performance data what we found really interesting that the lower propellers generate less thrust and this was backed up by in-flight data. We simulated two airfoils. The heavy blue of the left airfoil indicates flow detachment at the trailing edge, meaning poor airflow onto the props and reduced thrust. So we went with the airfoil with a sharper closing angle. There was no difference with the arm with less surface area, so we went with the wider arm because it offered better torsional stiffness. The thinner arm showed lower drag by a small amount, but we were concerned that a floppier arm would make for a busier flight controller and reduced efficiency. The Streamline Mesh can be cut anywhere you want in Paraview, an open source tool, to see flow lines exactly where you're focusing your design work. I find this incredibly useful and just generally is super cool to look at. So an example of surprising aero simulation results at 400 amps, our motors really needed cooling. A hold in the stagnation point looked like a clever solution, but there was no noticeable cooling. So we went much more aggressive with triple vents and still no temperature drop. Then we tried a simple fix. Oh, easy. Just a gap. Seventy-seven. Oh, that's good. And finally got some good cooling. The airflow jumps the gap and it drags the air inside into this donut swirl across the coils. The streamlines reveal why the vents don't work. There is next to zero airflow through the motor. The gap between the wires is just too constricted. So air can't enter the vent and here you see it tries to get in but then gets bumped back out again because there's no space with higher drag and no cooling benefit. The simulations show the gap has the lowest drag penalty and no surprise the triple vents have huge drag. Plus this solution gives excellent ventilation during mushing flight. Tuning the flight controller to be rock steady at our crazy speeds was a marathon effort for Luke. The trick to avoid this nasty low RPM desync is high dynamic idle of 6000. These extreme high pitch props are finicky in hover and prone to desyncs. This process was pure experimentation. Some tweaks worked and others ended in the long walk to fetch wreckage. We first had slow wobbles. And then at 500 we got these fast wobbles. We did lots of flight testing to flight test the power systems and compare the aerodynamic performance to the simulation data. Then we lost our flying spot because it was too noisy for the owner. But then we're lucky to find a really scenic farm with a farmer happy for us to fly. And then it all clicked into place. Yo, my heart rate is racing. <laughs> that was bloody quick. How many? Tell me. I think over five seconds. Yes! Like... Uh, I don't even think I went full throttle. What? No ways! 
So the tune makes no a major difference. Now there's no wind, that was true. 400 amps, 100% for, let's check, from now to now. Okay, less than a second, maybe a second. Yeah. 570. <laughs> That the uh, fastest drone quadcopter flight ever. Ever. It was because Sammy got to 569, eh? It is super satisfying to be able to claim the fastest on the planet. You're finally, Chase. With a dirty body, no, not sanding, some tape there, camera hole. Okay. We had beaten the record by 12 in the high drag configuration with the opening on the nose for the camera. It was time to find out what it was capable of with its canopy on. There was not a breath of air and the flight was perfect. The speed crept up all the way to 585. Now we had bettered the record again by 27 kilometers per hour, 17 miles per hour. Now about the tumble crash. If using a digital control system, don't fly straight past your controller at extreme speeds. Doppler or something similar can drop the signal. It took two high-speed flyby crashes before we figured this out. At those speeds, even a brief signal drop triggers return to home, which is too much while moving that fast, and it tumbles. Here are some key takeaways from this project. Our power tripled since version 1 and so did the weight, but speed doesn't scale the same way because drag rises with the square of the velocity. Each record run needs about two and a half kilometers of space, one and a half miles, with a total flight distance of around five and a half kilometers, three and a half miles. Flights last 110 seconds with only 20% battery left on landing. At full throttle, the battery will drain in 23 seconds. These are the typical speeds during a speed run with getting into position and the peak and the return for landing Setting up for the speed run happens between about two and 300 kilometers per hour. A nice quirk with this drone. In a turn, Luke doesn't have to bank like an aircraft. He can go around corners like a racing car because without wings and only flying on body lift, the body lift is the same upwards and sideways. And the body lift is enough to take a 5G turn. I hope this glimpse into the process has inspired you or at least pull you deeper into the wild world of high-speed flight. If you enjoyed this, give it a like and share it with anyone who would appreciate the tech behind it. Thanks for watching.